Uh, thanks everybody for coming out today. Uh, welcome to the Cartoon Art Museum. First, please, an honor to have one of our old friends, Tom Sita, uh, introducing his news book, We Drink Anime. I know I can tell you all about it. I know it's years in the making. We've got lots of stories about it. Uh, but, you know, it's, I think we're ready to dive right in, so I'll just say a healthy a party of bon appetit. <laughs> and I'll turn it over to Tom. So let's give him Great. a nice. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll do the sitting down. So, um, thank you. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've written a couple of books now, and um, I was fortunate enough that when I became an artist in the in the an animator in the '70s, uh, a lot of golden age artists, uh, people from the who had done their best work in the 1930s and 40s, were ending their, their careers. So we could so we overlapped. So I would you know be able to go up to these like wonderful old artists from. Max Fleischer from Walt Disney, and like, tell me your secrets, old man. Tell me your secrets. Uh, well, I remember I. Had to go. <laughs> no, no, no. Wake up, wake up. Tell me. <laughs> Teach me something. So, so you know, but I learned a lot from from all these guys and everything. And um, one of the things I find kind of fascinating. Um, could you go to the first slide, please? Is that first of all, animation and and any kind of art form. You know, when you see it on, on TV, like the making of stuff, everybody's partying around and having a good time and all. But the majority of animation is you're sitting at a desk alone, staring into a light box for hours and hours and hours. You know, you know, you're putting in 60-hour weeks and 80-hour weeks. You know, it was like, and that's the norm. You just worked very hard. You know, at these tables. Uh, next slide, please. You know, that's the ink and paint department on Who Framed Roger Rabbit, in 1987. You know, just before things were, went digital, this was like the last traditional sort of like, you know, uh, like when we were working on Who Framed Roger Rabbit, we thought we were doing the most technologically advanced movie then. And actually, we were doing like one of the last traditional films because everything started to go digital after that. But we were using real ink and paint and real celluloid and real film and all that stuff. So, uh, next one, please. So, the thing is, you know, when artists do have an opportunity, to relax, they party. <laughs> like, because it's, it's a hard job and you spend most of your time by yourself drawing. Uh, this is the Disney artist, this is the artist of Walt Disney celebrating the success of Snow White. And you know, they were all in their 20s at that point and all. And, and you know, and they were all concerned that you know, if, if Snow White didn't do well, you know, the studio would fail and they'd all be unemployed. So the fact that it, was, it wasn't just a hit, it was a monster hit. It was like Avatar. Like it did, it did more business. It did four times the box office of any movie of 1938, and a lot of that was like on children's half-price tickets. You know, because a lot of uh, theaters refused to show Snow White in the evening. They said, oh, "This is for kids. This is a kid thing," and everything. So they would only show it in the daytime, and they still made more money than all the other all the other movies put together. So it was a giant hit, and the artists just you know. We're so happy, they just went crazy. <laughs> like, so, I mean, um, there's a camaraderie uh, of a crew because you spend so much time together. You know, you know um, I always tease, I always tease my, my, my senior class at, at USC, and I, I tease them and I go, look around the room. You're going to grow old with these people. <laughs> your husbands and wives will come and go. These are the people you're gonna know for the rest of your life. <laughs> because you keep working with the same people. You know, I mean, Steve and I have known each other for I don't know how many years now, I think. At least thirty. Yeah, about thirty years like that. You know, and you know, somebody like Eric Goldberg, you know, Eric Goldberg created the genie in Aladdin and you know, all. Um, and you know, Eric and I worked together in New York, we worked together for Richard Williams, we worked together at Disney, we worked together at Warner Brothers, we worked together in London, we worked together in Hollywood. And it's just, you know, I've done them like 45 years, you know, and it's just, you keep working with the same artists, you know, because there's only so many people who do this, you know, it's kind of like professional stunt people, you know, like when you're a stunt man or stunt woman or something, they all, they all know each other. They are like, oh yeah, Bobby, he could really throw himself off a horse. Oh, he's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you know, they're, they're all tight. Next one, please. And you know, so when you get a chance to eat and everything, it's fun. And and one thing I noticed, and it's funny because uh, the book before this I wrote was about uh, com the history of, of of computer graphics and and how computer uh, computer animation, computer imaging, 
came to be. And one of the things I noticed that was in common between about computer graphics and traditional artists was that when your job is virtual, when you spend your life staring at a screen uh, and working with this, these things that don't really exist, you know, the characters running around and all, when you want to relax, uh, a lot of people's hobbies do something tactile. They want to, like people, like uh, I know a lot of people uh, garden, and a lot of people like to cook. And uh, I was talking with a guy in, uh, who in the 80s used to write very complicated glue code between, between programs, kind of like linking up like systems and stuff. And, uh, and, and his thing was refinishing antique furniture. So <laughs> it's like they just want to touch something, like physically, physically touch something. So I was surprised at how many artists, when I started asking them, said they like to cook. You know, so next one, please. Yes, yeah, so they like, people like cooking. <laughs> like cooking is fun and something that you can do. So next one, please. Yeah. So this is a party, um, this is a party of Warner Brothers. Uh, it's the same crew that did the Iron Giant afterwards. And then with this on Osmosis Jones. And uh, I always like to point out the fellow in the blue shirt. Uh, uh, he was one of my students. Uh, uh, his name is Mark Farquhar, and, and, and on Shrek, Evil Lord Farquhar is named for him. Because <laughs> originally, originally in the original script, uh, it, it, the original script had the bad guy as Le Evil Lord Hamilton. I said, so, well, Hamilton's a nice name, but it's not funny. It's just a name. You know, it's like Evil Lord Wellington or even Evil Lord Anderson. It's not interesting. You know, Farquhar. Farquhar's funny. <laughs> you say it, and you smile. <laughs> so, but, but and the good thing is Mark was a really good sport about it and everything. So like Mark would answer his phone and go, "Evil Lord Farquhar." <laughs> like that. So, all right, the next one, okay? Yeah, this is Don Han um, uh, uh, serving us uh, uh, what you call uh, doing a grill. He was a, he's the producer of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. He produced um, Beauty and the Beast and produced Lion King. And um, uh, uh, which go uh, and uh, every once in a while we'd have a cookout in the parking lot. The building behind us is the is the Grand Central uh, Airport Tower from the 1930s. Like the original Los Angeles Airport was in Glendale. This was like Amelia Earhart and uh, you know old Will Rogers and Harpo Marx. All of them used to go through that airport, and it was the original airport. And then around 1959 they decommissioned it because the the runway was too small. For, for modern planes to get on and all, so they, they, they condensed down. But when we were working there, people said, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the original tower. They used to call it the Casablanca Tower because they thought the, the ending of the movie Casablanca was filmed there. But actually it wasn't, and everything was another building, you know. And, but, but we like to call it the Casablanca Tower because it sounds romantic. Next one, please. Yeah, so that's me in 1990. Hi, you? come on in. Enjoy yourself, yeah. Take a seat. <laughs> so that's me in 1990 when I had dark hair and, and a waistline, and uh, <laughs> it's like when I, I was working on uh, I was working on Mickey's Prince and the Pauper at that point, and I, and I was using paper, you know, as so we're working traditionally. It's funny that you know all the years you know I teach at USC now, and uh, students will come through and I'll show them examples of work, you know, and, and uh, different stuff, and I have some. Paper animation, some paper animation left over from uh, from uh, Aladdin, you know, some some of the genie stuff that I was doing. I, well, I, I did the second song of genie, you know, the Prince Ali, wonder is he Ali Ababa, you know, hey, clear the way in the old bizarre, hey, you let us see that's a bright new star will come be the first stunning block to meet his eyes, da 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 da, like that. You memorize all these songs, you can't you can't get them out of your head. Yeah. But um, but what's funny was that I was showing some students around. And, and, and usually students would look and they go, oh wow, cool, you know, it's animation and all this stuff. Uh, recently I was showing a student and I flipped some stuff and he looked at me in horror and he was like, paper, 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 <laughs> like, like, like suddenly I look like, you know, an aborigine banging rocks together or something, you know, whatever, you know, like the thing, you know, whatever is like simple tools, so they go, yeah, we use paper, like the first hundred years was, was paper. <laughs> it's true, you know, but I never got that reaction before, like, like somebody in shock, you know, <laughs> so, next one please, yeah. Okay, so, um, 
I was talking with a, with a, a French historian about it, talking about collaborating on a project, and, and we were talking about some ideas for, for an animation history. And I said, you know, years ago in the 70s, I had a chance to assist Grim Natwick. And Grim Natwick, his real name was Myron, Myron Henry Natwick from, from uh, Chillicott, Missouri. But uh, everybody called him Grim. And uh, Grim lived to be 100 years old, which is wonderful. He died in 1990. But uh, Grim was the designer of Betty Boop. Grimm sat with a blank piece of paper and, and created Betty Boop. And, and, and uh, it's funny because he, he, when he was 100 years old, he was like, yeah, you know, I, this little dog named Bimbo. We had this dog named Bimbo. And we wanted Bimbo to have a girlfriend. So I made it, I wanted another dog. So it would be like a poodle. And he'd be a little poodle and he'd have these little curls, you know. And then the earrings would be his ears and all. And then when I got to her body, I was like, <laughs> so, so that became his that became his character. You know? and, <laughs> but anyway, um, they got to get to the football game. So. He was on the football team. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, he liked to talk. It's good. It's good. But anyway, uh, so Grim was the designer of Betty Boop. Um, he also was the lead animator on Snow White because Disney got him away from Snow. Uh, Disney got him away from uh, uh, um, you know from Fleischer uh, and made him the lead of the Snow White team. And like Mark Davis and Ward Kimball worked under him. You know, and 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 uh, and then afterwards he left after Snow White to return to uh, uh, Fleischer's. And uh, I, I met him first in the early '70s when he came to my college. And you know, college students always ask like very serious questions. And they go, uh, you know, and some student asked them, they said, when you left uh, Disney's, like right after the success of Snow White, to return to Fleischer's, were you rejecting the uh, rigidity, the sort of enforced conformity of aesthetic style that the Disney company was moving towards? And you were going for a looser urban gestalt of like the Fleischer studio. And Grimm goes, no, Max offered me more money. <laughs> 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 okay, <laughs> that makes sense. You know? <laughs> but and, you know, and, uh, Grimm also ta taught Chuck Jones how to animate. Because at, when Chuck started at the studio, he was doing what they called cell washing. And cell washing was they would take the acetates after a cartoon and literally wash the character off them. And then reuse them for another character. Because they didn't want to waste, because you know, acetate was expensive. And, all. and when he, he got promoted to, to an assistant, um, he didn't really understand the process other than what he was told. And, 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 and the Grimm took him across the street from the studio, bought him an ice cream soda, and explained, you know, how to animate, how to do keys and in-betweens and squash and stretch. Well, what's that? Which studio was that? That was at Charles Mintz. Okay. Yeah, it was like like 32, something like that, early 30s. So, I mean, Grimm got started in like 1918. <laughs> I mean, it's weird, like I assisted him. I was like 19 and he was like 87. You know, you know, and he was like talking about working, you know, voting for Woodrow Wilson. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this guy, you know, he was born the year of the Battle of Wounded Knee. <laughs> you know, it was like in 1890. You know, so, yeah, and he lived to, and, and he lived to be 100 years old. And uh, it's funny because we threw him a huge party, you know, for like a, the whole business showed up. And 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 he said, he said, a lot of my people, in my family are long livers, but nobody made it to 100. I'm gonna make 100. I'm going to drink with my buddies, and I don't know. And he did. He died like two months after his birthday party. You know. But that's what he wanted to do. And, and when he was on his deathbed, his, his then assistant, Dwayne Crowther, was saying, Grim, I feel so bad that you, you know you're dying. You know? And Grim goes, well, what do you want? 200? <laughs> <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But anyway, uh, uh, one thing Grim was proud of besides his animation was his chili recipe. He had his own personal chili recipe. So so after I assisted him, and you know, he gave me his chili recipe. So I thought, I got Grim Nattwick's chili recipe. And then I thought, oh, I got Walt Disney's chili recipe, private chili recipe. And I also have a recipe from Hayao Miyazaki for ramen, his own personal ramen recipe. So I thought, I could do a cookbook. <laughs> and you know, and the and and my the, my French friend was like, "That's an amazing idea." You know, it's like the fastest publishing deal I ever got. You just said cookbook, and they go, "Okay, <laughs> paperwork." 
you know, like bang, you know. So I said, okay. So I started asking artists, like, do you have a favorite dish? <laughs> Is something you like to do? And I found a lot of people had a signature dish that they enjoyed doing. So like, okay, so next one. So um uh uh what's the name? Uh, Benny Washam and uh, Frank Braxton. Frank Braxton was the first black artist at, at Walt Disney Studio. I mean, a lot of people say it's Floyd Norman, but even Floyd will go, Frank was first. You know, Frank started in like the early 50s. And, 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 um, uh, he, but he left the studio and went to Warner Brothers. He was at Warner Brothers for a long time. He died young of cancer in the 60s before he really, people really started to know his stuff. So he's really not that well known as, as, as an artist. But Benny was like the lead, uh, uh, was the lead of Warner Brothers for a very long time. And, and, and uh, he was the lead Chuck Jones animator. Uh, Benny always used to do like the last scene in the movies. Like, Benny would always have Bugs looking at camera and say, and Muggs, spelled backwards, is dumb. You know, and then Iris out, and that'd be the end of the card. So he always did the last shot, like in each film. But uh, in the 30s, Benny was also a, uh, um, uh, for a while, was, he was a short order cook. So, so he learned to be a cook before he was an animator. And, and actually, when, when he would sit and teach you animation, he had a little toothpick in the corner of his mouth. <laughs> like, and his tummy just looked like a skirt, you know, an apron could come out. Like, you know, he just, he looked like a cook. <laughs> you know, and and uh, he, he was a pretty good cook. And, and, and so, so he would teach you Warner Brothers animation, you know, and uh, he, was, he, was very, he was very good at it. You know. so, so I learned, you know, some recipes from him. Next one, please. And then uh, Robert Lentz helped me out. Robert Lentz was a storyboard artist at Pixar and at Disney. He was the head of the story department on Toy Story, so when, when they developed Toy Story. And Rob, uh, and Rob told me later that we worked together on Shrek and, uh, and a couple of the other, I think, Beauty and the Beast as well. And, and, and um, Rob told me that, um, that, that before he, be, he became an animator, he studied to be a professional chef. So I think he was uh, under Joe now. Oh, he was under Joe? Okay. I think Joe was the lead. Okay. And he was in on the staff. On the staff. Okay. So, but uh, but but you know you know he, he he studied cooking for a while and everything. So he helped me you know, test a lot of the recipes, do a lot of stuff. Because you know the problem with a lot of recipes is people will say stuff like uh, like Sergio Aragonas gave me his mother's paella recipe, and and and, and the problem is that the way that her mother would cook is like. They didn't measure ingredients. They go, how much saffron? You go, <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> like that. You go, I have to measure. I have to figure out what's the measurement on this stuff. You know? So, so Robert was great at that. Uh, this is Robert sent his photo. This is him in Moscow, sample, sampling cabbage soup, <laughs> like trying it out. And all. But, but he has a lot of a lot of great recipes and stories. Next one, okay. and this is Frank Thomas. And of course, Frank was the animator. It was a great animator on Pinocchio, great animator on Bambi. He did Captain Hook, uh, you know, and, and Peter Pan. He did so many fantastic characters, so many fantastic roles and all. And and, and, um, and that this is his omelet. So, <laughs> you know, he had a favorite omelet that he liked to make for, for, for the family. Next one, please. Yeah. This is Brenda Chapman. And uh, Brenda Chapman was the writer, director of Brave. You know, in fact, I think that Merida is based on uh, her daughter. You know, and, and she was saying that when they, she wrote Brave, she said, she said, you know, all the Pixar movies, it's always guys. It's always guys with daughters, you know, guys with children, guys with teenagers. He says, nobody made a movie about a mother-daughter relationship. And that's what, that's what she wanted to do. And, uh, and I, I worked with her on, um, on Lion King as well. She was the head of story on Lion King. And it's terrific, and and, uh, and she also co-directed co Prince of Egypt, so we worked on Prince of Egypt together, and that's uh, just a really terrific artist, and all. It's just it's just a, a very sweet lady, you know. Uh, next one, and uh, yeah, this is Sergio Aragonés. I said his mother's paella, and the pan, <laughs> and it's funny because she even says the best way to cook paella is is an outdoors. Yeah, you need like an outdoor grill, <laughs> and it's a, there's a photograph in the book. Of, um, of Sergio took the Mad Magazine artist down to Mexico to to uh, uh, you know and and, and her uh, and his mother cooked paella and it started to rain and there's a photograph of Jack Davis the, the great cartoonist standing over Sergio's mother with an umbrella <laughs> while she was finishing <laughs> but he said it's really good <laughs> so, 
And uh, Sergio was just like, you, know, you can't tell, he's a wonder, wonderful artist. Oh yeah, he did a thing about, he was in Mexico, and, 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 and they had a big table, and he had Bill Gaines, and, and all the Mad Magazine artists, and this is in the 1960s, they were all sort of lined up. And Sergio, just for the fun of it, because Sergio had a big black mustache and everything, you know. Um, Sergio, just for the fun of it, went over to the waiters and took a towel and put it around his arm. And, and just walked behind people and said, do you need another drink? Do you need more water, sir? Like that. And he said all the mad artists just ignored him or thought he was a waiter. <laughs> and started giving him orders. <laughs> like he completely went undercover. <laughs> Next one, and uh, this is uh, Ronnie Del Carmen. Ronnie's originally from the Philippines, and, uh, and this is his mother's uh, pula, as a pork adobo recipe for like pork pula. And uh, um, Ronnie's a terrific artist too. We worked together on Prince of Egypt, and uh, he's now like the senior, one of the senior story guys at Pixar. You know, and uh, he he wrote and, and co-directed Inside Out, and the other day on that one. And uh, it's funny, I was asking Ronnie, I, I told Ronnie, I said, I'm going to be in San Francisco for a talk, and you know, do you want to drop in? And he says, well, I'm stuck in Manila because the volcano exploded. And I'm like, oh, what an excuse. I, you know, I haven't heard that, you know, like, oh yeah, the old exploding volcano. Like, <laughs> how many times have I heard that? Like, <laughs> Next one, please. Yeah, and uh, see, and this one, of course, Hayao Miyazaki, and um, the, the the Ghibli studio. If you ever visit, the the first floor. It's a two-story building. The first floor, uh, uh, he has uh, off the lobby. He has a little lounge, like with a little bar, a, a little bar in the kitchen, and, and just like a rest area for the artists who just want to come down and unwind. And um, and when the studio is doing long hours, when they're doing like deadlines and they're working very hard, um, they rotate who gets to cook for the, for, for the crew. And when it's Miyazaki's turn, he does it. And like he has a, he had his own ramen recipe, and you, you know that that we went over. And I think you could go online. You could you, you could do a Google search to say you know, you know Miyazaki ramen, you know cooks ramen, and and, and you'll see a couple of a couple of fit films of him cooking. You know, it's just like the recipe we had, Robert Lentz and I, you, you know, interpreted back down to just for a small, you know, for two people or, 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 or a family. Because Miyazaki's recipe is for like cooking for 30. <laughs> you know, so all the ingredients like huge, like huge amounts of stuff you have to put in this big pot, you know. So it kind of like made it more simple. So, next one, please. Um, I was having a thing about about Chasen's. Um, Chasen's was a restaurant in Los Angeles from like 1936 to about 1998, I think it was. And and Frederick Chasen was sort of a failed uh, comic actor. He was like he was okay, you know, but uh, but uh, he, he he made a, a really good pot of chili. And Harold Ross, the editor of the New Yorker, in 1936, told him, you know, your career doesn't seem to be going anywhere, but you should open a restaurant. <laughs> you know, you'd be good at that. And he actually got front money from Frank Capra and John Ford, like like invested in his restaurant. So he opened up Chasen's, and Chasen's was a big Hollywood hangout. You, you know, I, I had a chance to go there, and it's like you know, Jimmy Stewart went there regularly, and Bogart and Bacall, and uh, supposedly uh, the drink, the Shirley Temple, was invented there because Shirley Temple wanted to come and, and hang out with all the all the stars who were all drinking. And everything, but she couldn't drink because she was like nine. <laughs> so they so they invented a non-alcoholic cocktail for her, so she could be cool. So the Shirley Temple. <laughs> and uh, the reason why I have these two here—that's Leopold Stokowski and Walt Disney. And supposedly, in, in 1936, uh, Disney was there to have dinner and was introduced to Stokowski over dinner. And the two of them sat down and started talking about the possibilities of combining animation and classical music. Which became Fantasia. 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 Yeah, that's that's how it started. It started from over dinner. The two of them were just kibitzing, you know, and, and talking about talking about uh, you know what they could possibly do. And uh, I, that actually Stokowski was actually eating spaghetti that night, but I gave him chili just because it's the chili thing. You know, you know. But Chase's chili was so popular when when uh, Elizabeth Taylor was doing Cleopatra in the '60s. She actually had. Pots of, of Chasen's chili flown out to Rome on, on a jet plane. 
so she can she can eat it on the set at Chinchin Ida uh, and everything in Rome, you know. And and Walt Disney loved his uh, chili also, and and would have it sent out. And I think that there's a story about you know Walt was kind of a funny guy because some artists like um, some artists like like Orson Welles and Charlie Chaplin, and even Chuck Jones to a certain extent, were what they call autodidacts. And an autodidact means you're a self-taught person. Like Orson Welles and Chaplin and all of them, uh, and Disney had very little uh, formal education. I mean, Walt Disney dropped out of high school to join the army in World War I. And all. So they, they, a lot of them compensated by overdoing it. Like Chaplin and, and Welles and all became gourmets and became very, very versed in, in serious literature and, and plays and things that they, they, they compensated you know, you know, in later years. And I mean, Chuck and I used to talk a lot of times. Like, Chuck loved to rap history. <laughs> no, he didn't want to talk about animation. He was like tired of you know. He loved to rap history. Joe Grant loved to talk politics. We used to talk politics all the time. You know that 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 they found that interesting. But Walt Disney, even though yeah, you know you know he, he became very famous and successful, he always kind of kept his plebeian, his working class roots and all. And his taste remained very simple. And he, yeah, I mean, he loved Chase's chili, but he could also get a can of Hormel and eat it out of the can, you know. Uh, you know, and he said sometimes for lunch, he would just go in the fridge and grab three cold hot dogs and chew on them while, while, while doing a meeting. So it didn't need to have a gourmet meal all the time. But there's a story about in the 50s when he uh, flew to Europe to do a, 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 a publicity tour for Disney movies. And even though he's in Paris and Rome, he sent back to, to Burbank to, to somebody to pack up a couple of cans of Hormel's chili <laughs> and send it out for him so he could eat it out of the can. So, <laughs> so please. And, okay, and that's Chuck Jones and Chuck the studio. And um, like I said, yeah, yeah, yeah Chuck's uh, family gave me a recipe for something called Eggs Golden Rod, which was like his uh, a personal omelet that, 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 that he was doing at the time. Next one. And uh, this is Bud Lucky. And uh, Bud Lucky was a local artist here in, in San Francisco who was a cartoonist designer. And, um, uh, which called, and, and actually, Bud is the guy who designed Woody from Toy Story. He's, a, he's the guy who really created Woody. You know Bud, right? Did, did oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, we were working side by side on Toy Story. If not for him, I would have been the oldest animator. <laughs> That's great. That's very good. Yeah. He has a Steve Siegel here, who's a who's an animator at Toy, um, Toy Story and a number of like very important, uh, which was uh, early computer you know, computer films to help Pixar get started. Good man. It so. would have made it without me. It's nice to be part of it. It's nice to be part. That's it. In at the revolution. So, <laughs> so um, but yeah, and, yeah. But, you know, and a lot of cases of the recipes. I left, I left the artists to say it themselves, like, like to give them their own, let's do it in their own words. And, and with Bud's, his, his, his little recipe thing, you know, so good, I just, I just reprinted it. I just, it's fun to see, you know, so. Okay, next one. And let's see, oh yeah, this is me and Hector Cantu. Uh, Hector uh, is, a, this is, we're in Dallas, Texas, we're doing Texas barbecue. And, and, and Hector um, uh, uh, does the comic strip Baldo. And everything, which is, uh, uh, you know, we did a, a, a TV show, uh, oh, I think for Univision, that was like half Spanish, uh, in Spanish and in English. And, and, and uh, Hector helped me uh, uh, interpret a, a recipe by an uh, artist named Gus Ariola. And Gu Gus Ariola was like one of the first, uh, he, he did a strip called Gordo about a little Mexican kid, you know, you know but it's like Mexican American. And, and, and the, they said that now you look at the humor, and the humor looks very, on PC, it looks kind of racist, you know. But but at the time, you know, Gordo like was was the first one to teach Americans how to say, you know, que pasa, and, uh, <laughs> and, like no mas, and uh, you know, well, as a, you know, you know, thing, hasta la vista, you know, things things like that all came out of his comic strip. So, because remember, in, in the early 20th century, uh, newspaper comics was the mass media, was the internet of the day. A lot of people read comic strips. And, and especially like the larger cities, the majority of the population are immigrants. You know, like my grandparents came from Poland and couldn't speak English and everything. And, but you got the newspapers because they were real cheap, 
it was just a nickel or something. And, 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 and you looked at the pictures, you looked at the comic strips and everything. So, so comic strips were very popular in the early 20th century. Uh, talking to a lot of the old, the old animators, that was their first ambition, was they wanted to be comic strip artists. Because comic strip artists were like mini rock stars. And then they fell back into animation when they couldn't get a job. You know, like they couldn't sell a comic strip. Like the, I heard like in the 30s, there was some artist who didn't want to be photographed in front of the Walt Disney Studio because they didn't want their parents to find out and go, I spent all that money on art school and you're working in a crummy flicker business. Like, <laughs> so, next one, please. Okay, uh, this is Tom Moore, and Tom lives in Kilkenny, Ireland. And, and, and he did the film The Secret of Kells and The Song of the Sea. And a very beautiful films, you know. Really, uh, you know, what's was kind of fun about them is that as much as Miyazaki's films are very Japanese, Tom Moore's films are very Irish, like very Celtic, you know. And it's, and it's very interesting the, the design work he does and all. And he's also vegan and everything. So so I got I uh, you know so, so he does vegan Irish recipes. And I go well, you know, Guinness is vegan. And it's, it's, like, <laughs> it's like there's no no meat or animal products in it. <laughs> it's okay. So, is the next one? Yeah, this is like one of Tom's designs and stuff. So, this is the type of work he does. They're very beautiful, very stylized stuff. And all. Next one, okay. And then uh, this is uh, Gendy Tartakovsky. And Gendy is originally from Russia. And uh, Russia via Callards. <laughs> and uh, he, he created Samurai Jack. And uh, he also did the uh, Hotel Transylvania. You know, you know, all the Hotel Transylvania movies. And uh, he does a lot of lot, lot of wonderful stuff, and um, he has a recipe because what uh, he grew up in Russia when it was still the Soviet Union, so so so, so he calls his recipe uh, uh, Soviet comfort food. <laughs> so, and it's like I think it's like chicken cutlets or something like that. So, and uh, but he's a very very sweet guy. Okay, next one, and then uh, who's, who's that? Oh, the Gene. Yeah, the, we also have what's called the Secrets of Disney's and Campaign Department. Mindy Johnson, who's a historian, who did extensive work on on the on the, um, the 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 female artists at the Walt Disney Studio. It, you know, they used to have what's called the Egan Paint Lab, and the big thing was was tea time and everything, because it was like it, it it became an exclusively female sort of sort of branch of uh, of the department, just because there was a, like a number of restrictions where they, no matter how good an artist you were, you couldn't get promoted. Outside of outside of the ink and paint department, so the ink and paint department was uh, was 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 like a, a, like an overly like sort of a, a female part of the company, and, but um, the big thing was uh, during their, their their afternoon break, they you know they, they would compete with one another uh, on recipes and stuff for for what they call tea time, so they'd have like you know certain cookies and cakes and things like that, homemade stuff and all. Ginny Mack was um, one of the great. Uh, she was one of the models for um, I think it was like for Tinkerbell or for um, uh, or, or, or for Aurora from uh, uh, from Sleeping Beauty. She looks like Aurora. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Disney Disney used her a lot of times as like a live action model. I think she could change with Tinkerbell as well. Was it Tinkerbell? Yeah. She did. She did. I think it yeah. was the hair. The hair. Was the hair. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> she had yeah. a little bit of Tinkerbell. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like Margaret Carey was the was the dance model that they used her for, like the, a lot of the live action, you know, sort of reference shoots and stuff. But Ginny was in on the early design work and, and stuff. So yeah, she just died, I think, like last year. So she was like in her nineties and all. But uh, but yeah, I've got a I've got a, a, what's a yeah I had a recipe of hers for uh, beef bourguignon, and then also some some some, some cakes and stuff. So she had done a lot of great stuff. Next one. Besides, besides, besides eating wonderful things, animators like to loosen the strings every once in a while. <laughs> like the old saying, you know, you know, a, a guitar that doesn't occasionally loosen its strings cracks. So, <laughs> so occasionally you, you you imbibe, you know. And, and, and there is a number of artists and, and, and uh, that that had recipes for cocktails and all. So next one. So oh, yeah, this is a little hard to see. This is, uh, but you'll, you'll see it in the book. This is me having a Manhattan in Manhattan. So, so, and actually, the restaurant I'm at, O'Neill's Balloon, was the, where they shot the last scene of, of um, Annie Hall. 
So to see what Woody Allen saying goodbye to Diane Keaton is at this little place that's called O'Neill's. And originally it was it was complete. Uh, the first version of the restaurant was completed during Prohibition, and they were going to call it O'Neill's Saloon. And then they said you can't do that. It's Prohibition. And everything. So, so so he didn't want to waste the sign, so he changed it to Balloon. <laughs> This world, why is a restaurant called Balloon? It's a O'Neill's Balloon. It's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. All right. So, so. But but anyway, it's a bunch of those things. So uh, you know, the uh, some different sort of drinks. And, and yeah, you know, Walt Disney had a Scotch Mist, and Mary Blair had a great martini, and Mark Davis, who created Cruella de Vil and Maleficent, she had a great martini. Um, there's a, a, the Davises, Mark and Alice Davis. And Mary Blair and Preston Blair and stuff, you know, and Lee Blair were all friends, and they would they would get together for, for dinner a lot. And 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 uh, Mary once wrote Mark, uh, uh, remember, uh, which will, I'll always leave a, a candle in the fridge and leave a martini burning in the window. <laughs> <laughs> the the other thing was that uh, John Canemaker, who was a professor at NYU, was also a, a, an Oscar-winning uh, short uh, animation filmmaker. Uh, uh, he sent me a recipe of a fellow named James Borgerero, and Borgerero was a development artist at Disney on Snow White and Pinocchio and Bambi, and, um, and, and he used to do this thing called the special, and the special was guys would get together, you know, the animation artists would get together for house parties, because you couldn't afford to go to a dance or a nightclub or something like that. It was in the 30s, you know. So people would get together to get a big, he'd get a big wash tub, put a block of ice in it, cut some fruit into it, and then take a couple of bottles of Chablis and a couple of bottles of gin and, go <laughs> and make a punch. And Alice Davis, who, who designed uh, It's a Small World, once said that, like, it doesn't really hit you until you're suddenly on the floor. <laughs> this stuff's good. <laughs> Next one? Yeah. And there's a little thing about practical jokes. And stuff like artists also like to do a lot of uh, a lot of practical jokes and fool around and climb around one another. So that's me in my Little Mermaid outfit. So <laughs> <laughs> I originally was going to uh, it was a Halloween thing one day, and I was going to I was going to go as Jessica Rabbit, and then my wife Pat said said No, you got to do it Ariel. You got to wear clamshells. So <laughs> so 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 uh, Eric Goldberg's wife Susan uh, uh, sewed my my uh, my my my, uh, my tail. And everything. And uh, the director of Little Mermaid, John Musker, says, uh, I still wake up screaming at night thinking about you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's sort of weird outfit. But you know, this was like, you know, the artists were always doing like little, little silly gags with one another. Um, Benny Washington was telling me about how they once took the, the, uh, uh, the water bottle out of the water uh, fountain thing, emptied it out, and, 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 and filled it up with margarita. So that was like one, you know. Uh, the other one was, uh, I mean, a lot of people won't remember this. I mean, you know, Eric, like you and I, we probably remember this. But the original Coca-Cola machines, like the, when you would buy a Coke in a machine, they, they were like horizontal, and it was like a big uh, uh, freezer thing. You would lift up this, remember that? You would lift up the thing. And the bottles were all in ice water. So the bottles were sitting in ice water with these little metal uh, claws that were holding them. And then when you pay the, you put in your coin, the thing would open up, and you could take the bottle out. Yeah. Remember those things? Well, uh, Tex Avery, the great uh, uh, MGM director, figured out how to get these things open. And, uh, so, so he would he would take a bottle or two, open them up, empty out the Coke, and fill them with scotch. <laughs> <laughs> and then he actually got the back in, so he could close them again. <laughs> so when somebody would buy it, like. <laughs> That was his idea of a gag, you know. And uh, Bob Clampett created Beanie and Cecil and all. Uh, there was a story about about um, about Bob sometimes, like while he was working at his desk, he had an open can of beer that he would sit on the table. And one day, uh, one of the artists took his took his uh, can, uh, you know, when he wasn't looking, emptied out the beer and urinated in it. Oh, he goes home. And he says, but but before he could drink it, somebody stopped him. So it didn't get to that point yet. He was just about to, no! <laughs> Don't do that! <laughs> but got, people were always doing gags. Always doing gags like that. The, the other one was Iwo Takamoto. Uh, Iwo Takamoto was the designer of Scooby-Doo. He created Scooby-Doo. He created Penelope Pit Stop and the Anthill Mob. 
A lot of the characters of the 70s was Iwo. And before Iwo was at Hanna-Barbera, he was at Disney, and he was the lead assistant on the uh, main character of Sleeping Beauty, on Princess Aurora. And so he was assisting Milt Call. And Milt was famous for having a really bad temper. <laughs> And, and, he, and he was legendary. He was, a very good he was a brilliant artist, but he was a very cranky man. And anyway, um, Iwo waited for Milt to go to lunch. And before he came back from lunch, Iwo was a, a small man. Iwo actually crawled into Milt's desk, actually got inside his desk, and, you know, underneath. And you know, Disney desks are like very big. You know? And he waited for Milt to come back and then start animating. And you know, when you're animating, there's this thing where you call it, you get in the zone. You, you know, or, or Dick Williams call it the flow. Where you're concentrating so hard that you're not aware of anything around you because you're just concentrating. So he waited for Milt to really be concentrating. And then he grabbed his ankles. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Milt screamed, <laughs> leapt up in the air, and yelled out a barrage of swear words. That were <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> So, but I mean, the, the people at the studio were always doing kind of like silly things like that, well, goofy things to one another. So. Other books that are out right now, the, uh, I wrote a history of computer graphics that, that, that was a lot of fun, that takes place a lot of stuff around here. And I just came out with a book on, on uh, directors. We did interviews with, with famous directors and all. And then uh, Drawing the Line was my book about the animation strikes of 1941 and 1937. Because I, I noticed, like, I, I knew a lot of those artists when they were elderly. And I noticed they were still mad at one another. It's like, even in their 80s, they were still mad at each other, you know, over what they did, you know, in that one summer of 1941, you know. Because, you know, World War II was so, so World War II was like six weeks later. And it was so overshadowed everything afterwards. But when you talk to the old folks, yeah, World War II was important, but the strike. The strike is what they remember, you know. And I just thought, what's what happened that was so, you know, traumatic that these guys carried this, you know, animus for the rest of their lives, you know. So, so I wrote about that, you know, which is kind of fascinating. There was a there was a fellow down, and he's passed away now, named Dave Hilberman, who was living in Palo Alto, and uh, and uh, he had the distinction of being one of the few artists personally named by Walt Disney to the House on American Activities Committee. <laughs> <laughs> because what a great, what a great like sort of thing to put on your resume, you know. Walt Disney personally faked on me. So. <laughs> but you know, you know, but it, it is funny because you know, he was always dodgy about about uh, his political leanings and stuff. And after he passed away, his son said, "Remember how my dad would never admit whether or not he was a communist?" I go, "Yeah, I go, he was a communist." <laughs> I thought so, but yeah, <laughs> so what? So, but anyway. They're all kind of, you know, I always find that I learned so much from anecdotes and so much from talking to a lot of these older artists, you know, you, you sit around with them and relax and, and, you know, and an old guy would say, you know, someday somebody should put all this in a book. <laughs> so, you know, that's it's what I enjoy writing. And, and, you know, the cookbook was kind of like a side thing, but... I tried to put a lot of stories in it, and also, even if you don't like cooking, you can enjoy it. You know, of the recipes, and all, I think about, I think about, uh, 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 I have seventy-three recipe, uh, what, uh, you know, about seventy-three uh, um, contributors, about eighty-three recipes, and of the eighty-three, I think three became professional chefs. They just decided they wanted to be cooks. Like one assistant animator is a, now the chief chef at the Ritz Carlton in Tampa. You know. And so I had very complicated recipes. They're really simple recipes. Uh, there was a fellow named uh, John Schnepp who used to direct death metal videos. You know, like, you know, like that, you know, you know, like this. And, um, you know, death metal stuff. And, um, and, and, and he had a recipe for a thing called picklebacks, which is, which is um, uh, rye whiskey and pickle juice. Mm -hmm. Throw back one, throw back the other. It's not my kind of thing, but uh, you know, my students like it. <laughs> they, think it's, they think it's fun. So, you know, teach his own. Uh, Bruno Bozzetto, who did Allegro Non Troppo, gave me a recipe for, for a, a garlic, um, a, a, for gar garlic pasta. And uh, he was saying one time that he was on a skiing trip and he made this for the family. And he kind of overdid it with the garlic. Because he noticed that, like, the next, 
the, you know, later that day, uh, when the family was on the cable car ski lift, you know, they get on those big cable cars that go up to the top of the mountain, they noticed that all the other people in the car would, would, had gone to the far end of the car, <laughs> <laughs> and kind of avoiding him. And, <laughs> oh, okay, too much garlic. All right. I'll come back on that. So. Anyway, next one. Too. So, anyways, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And everything for the time. Does anybody have any questions or anything? Anything? Any other? Is there anything you couldn't put in the book? <laughs> I don't, but you know what's funny? One I didn't get was um, Willie Reitherman's family uh, uh, were going to give me a recipe, and they didn't, they didn't get through in time and all. It just didn't, because uh, Willie Reitherman's niece, I think, is a, is a professional cook, and, and uh, couldn't do that. Um, one, of, uh, one of the things with Benny was funny was that when, when Benny Washam was working, he was working with a, ah, I can't remember the guy's name now, but it was a, he, he was another cook like him. They work together, and, and and he said, "Benny, come on, you know, quit this cartoon business. I got plans for a restaurant. I think it's going to be great, you know." And Benny's like, "No, I'm okay. I'm going to stay with Chuck. I like doing that." So the other guy went over to Bob's Big Boy. <laughs> but then Benny designed yeah. the uh, yeah he designed the character. Yeah, yeah. Benny designed the character of Bob's Big Boy and everything. That's that's the character. But but you know, he's like, oh, "What did I do that?" <laughs> Like every once in a while, there's those missed opportunities, and you're like, "Damn, I should have done that." Oh well. <laughs> so, I think what was it? Um, I think it was something Walt Disney said once, where he said, "If I could do it all over again, I would have bought that real estate in Beverly Hills when it was worth nothing." So. <laughs> should have done that. Did anybody else have any questions or any thoughts? Or anything? What's your favorite thing to eat that's in the? Oh my goodness. Um, I actually, it's, it's funny, well, my, the recipe that I made was that um, I, I, I did some ancient Roman recipes. And I did, and it's a recipe for like pork roast and apricot sauce. It's actually pretty good, you know. Like medieval recipes are kind of tough. Like medieval recipes are like, are like kill an ox, <laughs> stuff it with thrushes, <laughs> put some raisin sauce on it, you know. It's kind of, you know. But Roman stuff, I mean, well, some Roman stuff's a little weird, like, you know, dormice and the... Uh, Peacock's brains, <laughs> you know, and, no, 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 like that. But some of the recipes are quite palatable. They're a lot of stir fry and everything because they didn't have refrigeration, so a lot of stuff you make very quickly. Um, you know, stuff served over over rice or semolina because they didn't have pasta, obviously. And, and and the other thing was that the Romans had an all-purpose condiment called liquamen or garum, and and it was so basic to the Roman diet. It's like ketchup. Like imagine if you have to explain to someone what's ketchup. Well, ketchup, ketchup, ketchup. You know, and the Romans would go, liquid is liquid. I don't, I don't know. It's a fish sauce. They, the closest thing is Vietnamese Guam Nam. It's actually closer to like soy sauce. Oh, I use soy sauce for it. And, but actually, it's kind of nice. You know, there's like a fried carrots in, in honey and, and cardamom. It's like, it was kind of, that's kind of nice. You know, and, 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 and the, the pork fricassee was, was good. Uh, of course, the Romans didn't have forks. Forks was invented by the Byzantines originally. And, um, oh yeah, interesting thing, you know why forks are three, or, and, and like one on each end, you know, like five prongs? They're not two prongs, or like that? Somebody actually figured out that that's the minimum number to keep yourself from stabbing your tongue. Like, that. like if it's just two prongs, you'll stab your tongue. Like that. But, 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 you know, the line of like three with one on each side, like five, that's, that, that's like the minimum, the you know, Athena number. That that was figured out, I think, in the uh, in in the the, the uh, late Elizabethan age. I think, like around in Europe, it didn't really start to become popular about 1600. Cardinal Richelieu of like the three uh, three musketeers phase. And all, Cardinal Richelieu was the, one of the first ones to serve dinner where he actually had place settings. They actually put down a dish, you know, a fork, a knife, you know, not your own knife. <laughs> you, know, you, you just like they, they're in knives and a, and, and a napkin, you know, you could have a, and you could have, the, that was like, ooh, that was like a big deal. And then it transferred to America through Governor Winthrop and the Pilgrims, like the first ones to bring forks and stuff like that. So I, I find that stuff all fascinating, and, and, you know, where, where all that kind of stuff comes from. But anyway, any other thoughts? I mean, I like that. So. 
All right, well, Do you have any other books you're thinking about? Yeah, yeah, I've been, I, I, I've been, I've been, I've been contracted to write a history of, of the of the 2D, of the animation renaissance, like 1986 to 2003. It's an interesting argument that a lot of, a lot of people are having a debate about when did, when did the renaissance actually start? Because people will say, who framed Roger Rabbit? Then other people will say, um, uh, American Tale. You know, because that was like the uh, you know the first non-Disney movie to be a major animated hit, and that kind of shook up the Disney studio. They were like, "Oh my goodness," because you know, they were so used to being the only game in town. When being did Little Mermaid come out? Uh, 86. Eighty-six. Yeah. Little so, Mermaid was eighty-nine. Uh, eighty-nine. Yeah. Blue Frame Roger Rabbit was eighty-nine. That was my friend's Little Mermaid came out when I was. About to turn 18, that was the big movie. Yeah. We all went and saw it like 15 times. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I remember like Mermaid was like the first movie with, like, it actually, became, for an animated film, it became a date movie. You know, like, you actually like would go to the theater on a weekday at like 10 30 show and it'd be sold out. And you're like, wow, it's not it's not just kids, you know. So, oh, and I mean, when we were doing Who Framed Roger Rabbit, that, you know, then you could also say, well, Robert Zemeckis and Steven Spielberg were involved. And Zemeckis had had so many successes because he had just done *Romancing the Stone* and then uh, um, uh, *Back to the Future*, so he was on a roll and everything. But like when *Mermaid* came out, you're like, what, "Does the act just the Disney animation?" Do it? That was like, "Wow, that was like a big." You know, it's interesting. Um, Jody Benson was mentioning that that when when she first accepted the, the the job to do the voice of Ariel, other people in the theater called her up to offer her condolences. He <laughs> said, oh, you're doing animation, that's too bad. <laughs> like, your career must be on its last legs. <laughs> Does anybody give any uh, credence to the great mouse detective that's like the beginning oh, of Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, th th that's another one. Yeah, yeah, people say great mouse, but like, great mouse did okay. You know, it, it wasn't a flop. You know, it, it, it wasn't a super monster hit. But I mean, coming after Black Cauldron, you know, like Black Cauldron was was beat by the Care Bears movie. So the Care Bears movie was like a, was like a much huge, much better box office than uh, than Cauldron. So so so, Mount Great Mouse was like the, the beginning, you know, of the comeback. But I'm working on that, and 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 I'm also kicking around the idea of of, of doing a book just of historical trivia and illustrating it because I haven't drawn I haven't drawn on books in a long time. So I wanted to do some illustrations. And all that stuff. Just the kind of silly things, you know, you know, the little, like you, you know, I think I was showing the thing about um, King William the Third, you know, William and Mary of Orange, about his his horse. Um, he died when when his horse he was riding his horse around the palace, and he stepped in a gopher hole. The horse stepped in a gopher hole and threw him, and he broke his collarbone. But already being in his seventies, you know, he died like within the week. <laughs> you know, and and the exiled royal family, the Stuart family in exile, uh, that night offered toasts. They did copious toasts to the little man in the velvet coat, meaning the gopher. <laughs> so they, were so, they were celebrating the gopher. So, <laughs> so stories like that, I think, I think is kind of fun. It, you know, it's kind of interesting. You know, to, uh, yeah. Um, I have a question for you. Um, so all the the studios, you know, Disney and Pixar and mm -hmm. Chuck Jones and um, I forget who did Prince of Egypt. They all have a different style. Dreamworks. Uh, Dreamworks um, of how things are done. Do you have a particular favorite style that you like to do? Uh, well, you know, I'm sort of a, you know like uh, animators are kind of cast like actors, and, and like some people like to do dramatic stuff. Some people like to do superhero stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm more of a comedy guy and everything. I like doing the funny stuff, and I like working with the old characters. I mean, what uh, what I enjoyed about Who Framed Roger Rabbit was you get to animate. Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse and, and Daffy Duck and everything, and and those designs are so beautifully done that that you know when you work with them, it's like it's kind of like you're you you're a car park attendant and someone gives you a Porsche, <laughs> <laughs> it just handles well, you know, it just it feels good. <laughs> like, I mean, even like the early uh, Flint's, uh, you know, the early. Hanna Barbera, like Yogi Bear and the Flintstones and all, a lot of intelligence are in those designs because you pick them up so fast and you can animate them full, you can animate them limited, and they always look good. You know, you know they're always like, 
like nice, nice looking characters, you know. And that's a that's not an accident. That's somebody really a lot of intelligence went into those designs. Like the early Hanna Barbera designs by Ed Benedict and all. Um, those guys learned their stuff doing Tom and Jerry in the forties, doing beautiful full animation. Oh, wow. So they knew exactly where to cut back, like exactly where to stylize and all, and still make it look good. You know, so so those designs are a lot of fun. You know, like that, so. Anyway, okay. Well, thank you, thank you, everybody.